Yeah, like uh, my name is Burak and I'm a PhD student in Georgia Tech. Uh, I'm working on like intersection of machine learning, neuroscience and network science. But I'm machine learning student, so I work more heavily on the machine learning side of things. But I try to get some inspiration from neuroscience. Plus, we use network science because deep learning architectures are neural networks, and we believe we can analyze them from the lens of network science too. So I work with Professor Konstantin Dorolis, and this is a joint work. Today I will talk about our recent ICML paper, which is called NISPA, Neuroinspired Stability Plasticity Adaptation for Continual Learning in Sparse Networks. So I will briefly talk about biological aspects of continual learning. Then I will explain some of the related verbs in continual learning domain. Then I will follow by explaining our algorithm NISPA. Then I will share some experimental results. And finally, I will highlight some of the future directions we plan uh, in this work. So artificial neural networks achieve great performance on wide variety of tasks, but they primarily rely on fixed data sets and stationary environments. In continual learning, however, we have sequential tasks that change in time. So the environment is dynamic. Under such a continual learning scenario, models forget previously learned information upon learning a new task. And this is the one of the main challenges in continual learning, and it's called catastrophic forgetting. Because of this catastrophic forgetting problem, artificial neural networks lack a critical characteristic of general intelligence, which is sequentially learning more and more information over time. In contrast, the brain excels in continual learning, and it offers the only existing proof we know of that efficient continual learning is possible. Because of this observation, we study four mechanisms of the brain that we think that are relevant for continual learning and can be adapted to design of artificial neural networks. So first mechanism is biological neural networks are sparsely connected. Now I will give like two examples from smaller creatures. They are unique because we have access to wiring diagram of these creatures at neuron level. So first example is the C. elegans, which is a tiny nematode, and its whole neural network is dense to less than 4%. Second, we have the Dorosophila, or fruit fly. We have the full map of the optic medulla of this fly, and it is dense, its density is only 6%. And this sparsity is also the case in more complex brains, such as mammalian brain, for example. They are also sparsely connected. Here we see a plot of synaptic density of the human brain. And please note that like from now on, when I say brain, I will be referring to mammalian brain for the rest of the presentation. So like at birth, the human brain is sparsely connected. After birth, we observe a significant synapse formation and the density of the brain peaks around age of six. After this period, we observe a synaptic pruning driven by experiences. This phase is quite interesting because during this phase, new experience directly affects how the brain is wired. And after this pruning phase, become, the brain becomes sparse again. And its density stays relatively constant through, healthy, through lifetime in healthy adults. So to sum up, the brain is sparsely connected 
and we observe a relatively constant level of sparsity for the most of the life. Unlike their biological counterparts, artificial neural networks have dense connectivity. Uh, here I share like two of the main building blocks for most of the deep learning architectures. First, on the left, we have fully connected layers as their name stands for, like they are fully connected between layers. So layers are densely connected. On the right, we have convolutional layers. Despite the weight sharing, they are conceptually dense because the, each unit operates on all future maps of the previous layer. So they are also sparse and also dense. <clears throat> Second, the mammalian brain has dynamic topology. Brain learns through two types of plasticity. The first one is functional plasticity, which adjusts the synaptic transmission rates between neurons. And second, we have structured plasticity, which rewires the neural circuitry while learning tasks. In artificial neural networks, we observe a static topology. They have weight updates, which might be considered as analogous to functional plasticity. But there is no room for connection rewiring because layers are densely connected and all possible connections are already there. There is no room for changing the topology. Next, the brain has selective plasticity. So some connections are dedicated for remembering old tasks or old experiences, while others are dedicated to learning new information. Here, I will share an experimental result on mice. First, researchers put mice in a scenario in which they require learning new motor skills. Then they study how pyramidal neurons in the mouse cortex are altered in response to this novel experience. Here we see the formation of new spines after a learning period. And here we have some more quantitative results. And as we can see, exposure to novel experiences triggers more spine formation compared to control cases. And here we see how this process unfolds in time. First, while learning new, new tasks or new information, the brain forms new spines. However, only a tiny fraction of new connections survive the first few weeks after learning. Then these survived connections are stably maintained later in life to remember the associated skill. So for example, in this uh, figure, the red dot is kind of a frozen connection. It is a permanent mark in the brain uh, that is associated uh, for the learned skill. But we also have lots of gray dots which can be modified for learning new information, so they are plastic. So this indicates that learning leaves small but permanent marks on brain connectivity. To sum up, in the brain, we have task-specific stable connections for remembering tasks. Here, I show them with these colorful dots. However, we also have plastic connections that can learn new information, and they, they are indicated by these gray dots. In contrast, artificial neural network, in artificial neural networks, all weights are equally plastic. By this, I mean we apply the same learning rate to all parameters. And that's why there is no stability to remember previously seen examples or tasks. That's why deep learning models require revisiting all tasks frequently. Otherwise, they just forget them because new information overrides learn knowledge, and this is the catastrophic forgetting problem. 
Finally, the mammalian brain continues learning more and more tasks with fixed number of neurons. Of course, there is neurogenesis in few restricted brain regions, but we know that growing the brain is not the primary mechanism for learning. In contrast, deep learning architectures, it is very common practice in deep learning that we add new modules to the architecture as we need to learn more and more tasks. So now I will briefly explain some of the research directions in continual learning. The first direction is regularization methods. This type of methods apply an additional term in the loss function. And idea is that we identify and protect important weights that are associated with the previous tasks. Second, we have architecture methods. And I divide them into two categories. The first one is expanding networks. Here we dynamically allocate new neurons or new resources for new tasks. And we have we also have fixed network architecture methods. And idea is that different parameters for we will have different parameters for different tasks. So we will isolate certain parts of the network from each other to avoid interference between different knowledge. Finally, we have replay methods. Here we store or generate all task samples and we frequently replay them to remind our model about the previously seen tasks. This comes with significant overhead and it is sometimes not possible, for example, because of the privacy concerns. We can't just store the whole data sets, for example. We know that brain employs some form of replay, but most of the proposed continual learning methods uh, use some kind of replay that is not biologically plausible. For example, they store images in pixel level. We know, we know that this is not happening in the brain. There are also continual learning approaches with uh, biologically plausible techniques that employs replay. But since our work NISPA focuses on the structure side of the brain, I will not go details of this, that kind of related works or like how brain employs it play. So now I will give a few examples about these three, two classes of continuous learning methods. The first one is an example for regularization. So for example, memory aware synapses is one of the famous examples. Here we have important score for each weight and it determines the plasticity of the corresponding weight. Regularization methods have selective plasticity like the brain because each weight has different plasticity and they can learn multiple tasks with, without adding new modules. However, they have fixed and dense topology. So units are highly entangled. This means even a slight change in the weights affect all other units. And that's why small changes accumulate throughout the network and these models still suffer from forgetting if the sequence is very long. Second- Hey, hey Barak, I have a quick question on that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want interruptions along the way or- if Yeah, that's okay. Wait along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so would you include synaptic intelligence in this category here? Yes, I would. Eat it. Okay. Yeah, for example, also elastic weight consolidation would yeah, go into yeah. this category. Mm -hmm. So, second example is progressive neural networks. This is one of the main or like most well known example of architecture methods with expanding networks. The idea is that after learning a task, we freeze the whole network. Then we, with new tasks, we expand the network by adding horizontally connected subnetworks. Here we have selective plasticity and dynamic topology. But the problem is that here the overhead is huge. The network size 
grows linearly with every new task and this method becomes quickly interactable. My final example is continual learning via neural pruning method or in short CLMP. This is a good example of an architecture method with a fixed network. So the idea is that at the end of each task, we select important units for the associated task. We isolate them by removing some connections. And finally, we freeze the connections of this isolated subnetwork. So instead of network growth, here we distribute available resources across different tasks. But it comes with few problems. The first problem is that this method works with dense connectivity. So isolation is very hard. We drop lots of connections to remove one part from other. Also, as I said, this selection and isolation happens at the end of a task. So there is a performance loss because of this dropping operation or removal of connections. And there is no recovery phase uh, that can gain the performance back. So a network does not recover from this damage because of the connection removal. And finally, one there's one counterintuitive thing about this method is that network loses connections with every task because we need to remove connections to isolate certain parts. So as the number of things we need to learn increases, the number of parameters are decreased. So we quickly run out of capacity to learn future tasks. Now I will talk about our method. NISPA combines previously explained concepts of the mammalian brain. First, like the brain, NISPA uses sparse networks with fixed density to mitigate forgetting problem. Second, NISPA dynamically changes its network topology when learning a new task. And third, similar to selective plasticity in the brain, NISPA freezes specific important connections to retain previously learned information. And finally, like the mammalian brain, NISPA learns more and more tasks over time with fixed number of units. So uh, number of units or like connect number of units are fixed and number of connections are also fixed, but we change the topology of connectivity. So in summary, NISPA sequential learns multiple tasks. It does not need to revisit all the examples to remember them. And it accumulates more knowledge into a fixed number of units. Our method starts by dividing all units into three categories. The first category is plastic units. All units start as plastic and they are dedicated for learning future information. Then we have stable units. Their role is to preserve previous learned information and they serve as a memory for our method. And finally, we have candidate stable units. They are, a they are kind of a transition state between plastic and stable units. And their role is to learn the current task that the model sees. Here is the transition diagram for these three states. First, plastic units can become candidate stable units or vice versa. And this is based on the activation of units for training examples on the given task. Second, a candidate stable unit may become stable unit at the end of a task. And stable unit is kind of terminal state in this transition diagram. So once a unit becomes stable unit, it will never become plastic unit. And I will talk about this point in the future works too. 
Okay, as I said, we use activations for these transitions. So one may ask whether activation of a unit is a valid integ indicator of its contribution to a task. And prior work suggests that the answer to this question is yes. So here I present a very simple example on any data set, but the same observation holds in more complex architectures and data sets as well. So here we see that removal of highly active units has a detrimental effect on the performance of network. Another concern might be whether too many units will be selected as stable. Of course, this will not leave enough plastic units for subsequent tasks. But experiments suggest that using ReLU activation leads to highly skewed per layer activation distribution. So here I show this phenomenon on MNIST. But again, the same observation holds in more complex data sets as well. As, as you can see, we have large number of units with very low activation. They are on the left uh, tail of this distribution. And few units are in the right tail, which highlights that these units are highly active. This suggests that we can preserve most of the activation in the network by selecting only few units. So we will still have many plastic units for future tasks. Another important point is that this skewness is enforced by ReLU. Therefore, it is the skewness is high even at the initialization and it remains high throughout the training. So we can exploit this phenomenon at any particular time during the training. So the next question is when we make this selection or transition between plastic to candidate stable units. So we start by dividing each task training into multiple phases with few epochs. And candidate stable units are selected before each phase. Algorithmically, we have two steps for selection. The first step is we compute the total activation for all training samples. Second, we find the smallest set of units that capture at least a fraction tau of layer activation. Here, tau varies, during, varies dynamically during the training, and it serves as a dynamic threshold for this selection. So as I said, we vary tau dynamically, and we use relatively simple strategy. We just use cosine scheduling to decide on tau. The motivation is as follows. The first, initially we keep tau high to give all units a chance to become stable. This is because activations can vary significantly in early phases because our model is just start learning the task. So it is better to start with a large tau. As the training proceeds, activations becomes more stable, and we start restricting the selection even more. So we will only have few stable units. A uh, quick question on this. So it sounds like, just make sure I understand correctly here, this tau determines, does it determine which units are candidates or which units actually become stable? Which units become candidate? Become because, candidates. Yeah. The selection from like stable to, sorry, plastic to candidate stable units is based on the activations during uh, yeah. training. Uh, I will go to like how you go from candidate stable unit to stable in like a few slides. So we okay, can, okay, yeah. But even here, um, okay, that that's helpful. Even here, though, even at the extreme end, it still seems like you know, 60% of the units or 80% of the units could still become candidates. Oh, okay. Uh, this is the tau value. Oh, okay. It's not the percentage. Yeah. So 
we find the smallest set of units that capture, for example, 70% of the layer activation. Right, right. Its power is 0 0.7. Yeah, there is a correlation between number of units and tau, but it is not like direct correlation. It yeah, so if it's very skewed, like you showed earlier, it could still be a very small number of actual yeah. units. Yeah. So after the selection phase, we do rewiring. And rewiring consists of dropping step, which preserves the which helps preserving the knowledge. And we also have growing phase, which promotes learning. So in while dropping, we drop connections from plastic units to candidate stable units. This ensures that changing plastic units do not affect the candidate stable units because after this operation, candidate stable units do not receive any input from plastic units. However, candidate stable units can still share knowledge through outgoing connections with plastic units. Another way to interpret this is that dropping forms input-output paths that only pass through candidate stable units. So we construct a subnetwork that consist only uh, with candidate stable units and this subnetwork is dedicated to learn the task at hand. After this dropping operation, we perform growing and for growing, we have two options. First, we can drop, grow a connection between two plastic units. This type of connection growth promotes learning new representations or we can grow a connection from stable to plastic units this can be either candidate stable or stable unit i am just so showing candidate stable here this type of connection growth promotes reusing previous learned information note that we drop for each dropped connection we grow a sa same number of connection in the same layer. So we preserve the layer wise density, which in turn preserves the density of the overall network. We didn't, uh, like, we have two types of connection growth, but we didn't optimize how we choose between these two types. So it is basically random, and I will discuss this point later in the future works. Okay, we perform multiple rewiring cycles for each task. And once the task ends, final set of candidate units become stable. Here, our motivation is to form stable structures in the network that will serve as a lifelong memory for the learned task, just like the stable spines in the mammalian brain. And recall that we enforce smaller tau as training proceeds, and we have this skewness in the activation. So once we are at the end of a task, we will only select few stable units because we will have very small number of candidate stable units. So we still have many plastic units reserved for learning more information. After promoting candidate stable units to stable units, we freeze the connections between stable units, and this guarantees that gradient descent for future tasks will never alter stable units because they do not receive any input from plastic units, and we freeze the other connections. So they will never change and serve as a memory. And do you freeze the weights as well, or just the connectivity? Uh, we freeze the weights. Yeah, this blue okay. connections means the weight is frozen, so no updates. But hopefully, we are not like freezing lots of parameters because we have few units and they are sparsely connected. So the intuition is that although we lose some capacity of learning with freezing, it is not that dramatic. Okay, but there's still going to be some maximum number of tasks that you can learn 
it definitely uh, because we based have, on that skewness thing yeah yeah we propose lots of hyperparameters to tune like the plasticity or like the stability but since we have fixed number of units fixed number of connections at the end of the day network will become like mostly frozen and will not have enough capacity to learn from one point so to sum up we divide each task into multiple phases at the initialization we start with a randomly pruned network and all units are plastic before each phase we select candidate stable units initially nispa selects many candidate stable units because tau is high as training proceeds, we start selecting fewer and fewer candidate stable units. Selection is always followed by connection rewiring. And this selection and rewiring cycle repeats multiple times until further phases start decreasing the performance. So intuitively, instead of doing uh, early stopping in epoch level we are doing early stopping in the phase level and once the task ends we promote candidate stable units to stable units and we freeze the connections between them and the same cycle repeats for the future task but note that we carry stable units from previous task to future task so that's why they serve as a memory for our method Now I will. Uh, sorry, one one more clarification on the. So and then during this entire process, you're doing standard backprop. Yes. Um, uh, you know, other than the fact that some weights are frozen. Yeah, some weights are frozen. We do rewiring sometimes before each phase, but besides that, we use gradient descent. So now I will briefly explain our evaluation scenario we generate a sequence of tasks by slicing existing benchmark data sets into smaller tasks each task introduces a set of new classes the task boundaries are available to the learners and we assume there is no access to samples of the previous tasks so every task is visited only once and they are never revisited again by the model. And last but not least, we provide task identifiers during testing. So first, we start with a control experiment. Suppose NISPA has a P parameters and T tasks to learn, then we have two control baselines. The first model is single task learner with p parameters we denote it by stl and this is an upper bound because it corresponds to dedicating all parameters to a single task second we have single task learner with p over t parameters we call this stl iso this is like a lower bound because it corresponds to partitioning network into T equal sized subnetworks that are totally isolated from each other. And one thing to note is that this STL and STL ISO has the same depth with NISPA. We are not playing with the depths in this experiment. So here we see that NISPA nearly matches the performance of, of STL and it significantly outperforms the STL ISO. This highlights that NISPA's success is not only due to parameter isolation, but sharing knowledge across tasks with these new connections that we grow is a crucial part of the success. But one thing to note is that we observe if the sequence is very long, as, as in the case of C420 tasks, the accuracy gap increases as NISPA sees more tasks. And as you can see on the right, the problem is that we run out of plastic units, especially in the later layers 
for example, in the last convolutional layer or the penultimate linear layer before the outputs. This is because these units have more specialized or high level features that are less shareable and NISPA eventually run out of capacity in these layers and we see a performance gap. Next, we compare NISPA with other continual learning methods. Here I present three regularization methods and one architecture method, CLMP, which, is, which I mentioned in the related works. As you can see, NISPA outperforms Bayes science significantly, and it is using 10 times, up to 10 times fewer parameters because we have sparse connectivity and the space lines have dense connectivity. So we are more efficient and we still have better performance. Next, we investigate the optimal density level in which NISPA performs the best. We found that optimal density is determined by multiple factors, such as data set number of tasks, the domain of the tasks, and model architectures. But although optimal density varies, it is always towards sparse networks. When the density is too low, the model suffers from underfitting because we don't have enough parameters. But when the density is too high, we have too many entangled units and catastrophic forgetting problem becomes much harder to solve. To sum up, sparsity is essential for NISPA success in continuous learning. Finally, we analyze the effect of task similarity on the number of stable and plastic units. To control the similarity between tasks, we have a two task scenario. The first task is the standard MNIST, and the second task is the MNIST with permuted pixels. We choose this task because random permutations are equally challenging for multilayer perceptron because features are fed in a flattened vector, and multilayer perceptron is not aware of like structured. Uh, input. So all tasks are equally challenging. This means only variable is the in this experiment is how many pixels we permute, which determines the similarity of tasks. So we have this permutation knob that we can uh, tweak in order to get similar tasks or very different tasks. Here on the x-axis, we have the degrees of permutations and the, on the y-axis, we have number of additional stable units selected after the second task. And here we observe that if tasks are similar, NISPA automatically reuses existing knowledge and it does not select additional stable units. So in conclusion, this is a neuro-inspired continual learning approach. It uses sparsity and dynamic connectivity to avoid catastrophic forgetting. And it outperforms baselines using up to 10 times fewer parameters. However, there are lots of open questions about NISPA. The first thing is that we know that brain selectively forget things, especially if they are not recalled frequently. So as humans, we do not have perfect memory. So in future work, we will explore strategies to unfreeze some of the stable units when the number of remaining plastic units drop below a certain level. So our hope is to have controlled forgetting mechanism, which can return some capacity back to the model if we are seeing lots of tasks. Second, as I mentioned, our connection growth has two types of connections, but besides that, it is mostly random. So we, we plan to use some network theoretical metrics to guide our connection growth decisions. Third, NISPA starts with a randomly pruned network and it evolves the topology while learning new tasks. So we plan to study evolution of this topology by 
using uh, like from the lens of network science. We will analyze input output paths and other network properties such as node degrees. Maybe we can find some interesting patterns as or motives in the network that associated with lifelong memories or we can diagnose some of the problems in NISPA. And finally, besides sparse connectivity, we know that brain employs sparse coding or sparse activations. We want to explore strategies to simultaneously exploit both types of sparsities. For example, maybe with sparse coding, we can have more skewed activations. This will lead selecting even fewer stable units, and we can save more plastic units for future. So thank you. All right, thank you, Barak. Yeah, thanks. That was great. So I, I have uh, one question. Um, mm -hmm. So conventionally, in the early days when they <clears throat> trained con <clears throat> excuse me, con networks, they mm -hmm. noticed features, low level, uh, uh, low level image processing features evolving in the lower layers and then gradually going up to more general mm -hmm. stuff. So one of the things that strikes me is that when you have a set of tasks and you do your network analysis as to follows the topology of where their stable units are, whether you ever considered moving the boundary of the layer because you keep the sparsity constant between the layers Mm -hmm. but maybe whether you can compress say the earlier layers to those common sub networks that are being used by all the tasks and then allow the other networks expand outwards to handle the uh, special cases so kind of creating a, a a formal separation between those things that are general and those things that are task specific i see that's quite interesting point we didn't consider that because uh, like as I present, we have like, we are applying our algorithm locally in each layer. The one motivation is that if we use global information, let's say we analyze all the units and make decisions based on that, probably it will be less biologically plausible because we know that neurons make decisions locally. And this is one of the reasons that we try to keep our algorithm just based on local activations instead of, let's say, removing one part of, or like having isolation in the upper parts and having like reusing in the shared features. This will require our algorithm to be making some global decisions, I guess. I think- Well, the... or at least layer to layer decisions, because, in, in some sense, the whole notion of a finite set of layers mm -hmm. is not necessarily biologically plausible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, is that, you know, anything you do to move the boundaries there, I think mm -hmm. is, is fair game because of what, what the whole notion of layers structure imposes upon the whole learning problem to begin with. Yes, okay. Yeah, that's quite interesting thought. Yeah, yeah, probably in the brain we don't have this kind of like fixed number of layer structure. So yeah, I got your point. Yeah, still we can suggest that this is biologically plausible if we just have like trans like the movement from one, like removing maybe from one layer to adding it to the next layer is still biologically plausible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you can consider that those those people have networks that have a common layer, then they fan out to other sub layers mm -hmm. where there's no crossover between them. It, it depends upon how the architecture of the brain is is wired, and so you have some degrees of freedom there to isolate things and still say, yeah, well, okay, biologically possible, everything is not even potentially connected to everything else. So mm -hmm. how do we how do we how do we kind of you know allow that to evolve in that kind of natural fashion. But anyway, you, you you have a great framework there in which to explore a bunch of these ideas. So I applaud you for that. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the great suggestion. Actually, this could be like a very good future direction to investigate more. And I think this kind of approach will, will be very interesting for the people in neural architecture search domain, because some people investigate this type of strategies to evolve the network based on the task, getting like an optimal structure for the given task. So yeah, this would be a very interesting direction to take. Yeah, this is really interesting. Thank you. Did, I forget in your benchmark, did you compare against the uh, non-continual learning version of the thing? So if you train the network on all the tasks simultaneously, um, I, I forget if you... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we have that kind of analysis, but not in these slides. The, actually, there's like a small implicit uh, caveat about, com okay, it is called like, some people call it multitask learner, which learns all the tasks at once. And the problem- Yeah, is I mean, just a, just a standard batch training of Cypher 10, you know, just because uh, that, that also gives an upper bound uh, mm -hmm. of what you can reach. It's you know, it's using the same number of parameters as this current. Yeah, but, you know, but the network, thing but... is that this last uh, item in the evaluation scenario. So we provide task identifiers during testing. So mm -hmm. intuitively, let's say instead of in CFR 10, instead of learning one versus nine classification, our model learns binary classification. But if we use multitask learner, it will learn a much complex task, just like a single model, it will learn one versus nine classification. I see. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your output is only two. You're only comparing two things at a time here, two yes. classes at a time. I see. You don't have. Yes. For example, in C yeah. 100, we have five classes for each task. Then we also have some experiment with EMNIS, which is like extended version of EMNIS with handwritten letters. Here we have like, we go up to 15 classes per task, but still comparing it with the standard learner is not a fair game for, and it is very easy to outperform it because it performs much complex tasks. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's trying to compare one against nine as, as opposed to, mm -hmm. yeah, I see. So, in, so you do outperform that. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. But like intuitively, it is not the same task. So. It's not the same. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And in the actual paper, we also extend NISPA with replay methods. We use very simple replay, very simple replay mechanism on top of NISPA. It is not like the we are not claiming that part is biologically plausible, but we also show that this our framework can beat other replay methods with very simple replay on top of it. So mm -hmm. like replay is kind of orthogonal to NISPA and NISPA can benefit from replay and outperform that kind of methods too. So we have like more extended evaluation in the actual paper. Right. Have you thought about how you can remove this limitation of task identifiers provided? Okay, it is like the, one of the main challenges and I hope that we will find a way but there are lots of problems with that because first, if we do not perform any type of replay, reusing the previous information causes interference. So there is like an unavoidable trade-off between reusing the representations and mixing two classes between each other. So replay solves it, but it is biologically impossible. My hope is that we will come up with a mechanism to maybe replay the activations or some reminder of the previous tasks instead of just storing the previous samples inspired by the neuroscience. And we can eliminate this problem because the main problem is that NISPA does not use the task identifiers at any layer except output there. So we only use task identifiers to have a isolation in the output layer. So I think with some additional tricks, we can avoid this problem because actually most of the continual learning methods use this kind of task identifiers throughout the architecture, and it's a big limitation. 
I think it is because it's not very useful if you have to know it during testing, mm -hmm. you know, in a practical scenario. Yeah, I think it depends on the test. For example, now I'm showing in the classification task, but let's say we are using reinforcement learning task. In that kind of scenario, it is maybe more makes sense to assume we will have task identifiers even during testing. Yeah, yeah, but um, reinforcement learning introduces a whole set of other challenges. Uh, yeah, yeah, extending this to reinforcement learning uh, would be interesting, and how you. Uh, yeah, for yeah, example, I, I was talking this with some people that works in reinforcement learning, and talking about how we can use this algorithm in the uh, reinforcement learning setting. For example, one problem is that. In the reinforcement learning, it takes huge amount of time to learn the first policy that will make things much easier. But since we make connection rewiring, maybe removing single connection will make us forget this very important initial policy. So we will stuck in this loop where we're trying to learn the same policy over and over again, and we can't stop learning the task. So yeah, reinforcement learning comes with lots of problems and it yeah. would be very interesting and challenging to apply most of the continuous learning algorithms to reinforcement learning setting. Yeah, yeah we used, um, I, I don't know if you've seen our paper from earlier this year, but we applied this to, uh, applied our continued learning thing to multitask reinforcement learning. So it wasn't a continual learning scenario, but it was a multitask learning scenario, a reinforcement learning scenario. Um, yeah, we got it to work, but there are definitely a lot of challenges. Uh, the mm -hmm. reinforcement learning stuff is extremely noisy as well. Um, mm -hmm. Other challenges. Cool. Have you thought about a, a simpler question? Maybe is applying this to convolutional networks? Oh, okay. Actually, that's more straightforward. I think we, we are using convolutional neural networks for CFR ten and CFR hundred. Oh, okay. 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 I didn't understand that. I, I, I think the notion is just how you define units in convolutional mm -hmm. networks. And I am just showing it in like multi-layer perceptron setting, but once you define the idea of units, the same ideas extends to convolutional neural networks. And actually in the paper, I explain how you can trans transition, get a transition from multi-layer perceptron to convolutional neural networks very easily. And, and what do you consider a unit in that case then? So each filter, and yeah. then it becomes like, Connections become matrices instead of these single connections. Mm -hmm. And then dropping becomes setting all matrix to zero instead of like setting one weight to zero. So each filter is considered an individual unit. Yes. At that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the logical way. Yeah. Yeah. Then like the idea is basically the same. Yeah. Cool. One maybe interesting thing it would be is that if this, I, I am not sure whether this algorithm may scale to very, very deep architectures. So we experiment with the relatively smaller convolution neural network, and it would be interesting to test it on, let's say, ResNet 50 or that kind of architecture. Right. I don't have I think any... one interesting thing is, you know, you showed the, the number of, of units that are available um mm -hmm. gets more challenging with convolutional networks because typically you have much smaller number of filters yeah uh, you might have uh 32 or 64 or 128 filters as opposed to you know a mm -hmm. thousand units or something you know? yeah maybe one thing is that convolutional neural networks come with a challenge but i think they're more shareable so right maybe we can run out of plastic units in some layers but since they learn to extract some abstract features, they will serve well, even though they are like frozen. Mm -hmm. And like we always assume that we will be seeing same the task from same domain. So since we are seeing like images all in every task, maybe there's lots of this share between tasks. And yeah, yeah, particularly at the earlier layers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I have a, a question. Uh, do you use conventional dropout while you're training these? No. Okay, so when you were talking about the difficulty in reinforcement learning that if you drop a connection, you might 
spend an inordinate amount of time trying to relearn it. I'm just kind of curious if you have a connection that you decide to drop, whether you do it probabilistically rather than a hard drop and seeing if the network can change its mind, if you wish, because it tries it with and without multiple times. Okay, I think I got your point. Like, I think if we let the model decide on the connection uh, rewiring itself instead of us like putting some rules to it, that will be goal of optimizing the current task. And it's a chicken and egg problem because we don't want everything to be optimized for the current task. And the reason is the reason that we make a hard drop is that we want to ensure these plastic units do not spread their change to like the stable structures in the other parts. So I think we need to have that kind of hard drop because this, if we make it probabilistic, it becomes kind of regularization method. And to be honest, I don't know like regularization methods that is like very robust to catastrophic forgetting most of the time they fail in long sequences. Well, I, I guess it would be a way, maybe it's not a um, an autonomous mechanism, but it'd be a way to decide uh, if, it's low in the current task, but it has utility in other tasks. You have a gradual way as you slew through the task trainings of the saying, I've marked this thing as potentially not useful, but you know, if I make if I disappear it entirely, I have no chance of reinforcing it again. I see. So to the goal of allowing this thing to be a general learner. <clears throat> it might allow you a softer edge to that decision point. I see probably this can also pave the way for one of the items that I discuss in future works, which is selective unfreezing strategies, for example. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. But you could you could do it in a principled manner that you say, I've marked this thing, you know, I mean, it could be proportional to how much it's low activation. I mean, if it's dead, dead, you know, then you say, okay, low probability of recovering back. But if I'm right on the threshold, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe, maybe I want to have a, a softer edge to it, even though not on off. It's kind of like uh, rather than modifying the weight, so it's <clears throat> always there, you have a soft edge that's a probabilistic thing where it's sometimes there, sometimes not. So it becomes, it's potentially possible the network learns how to be robust against it being there or not, but mm -hmm. without, you know, catastrophically killing it so it could never recover. I see. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Probably we want to have that kind of mechanism because now we, we are very concerned with the stability and we make very hard decisions to have stability, but this is not happening in the brain. We gradually forget things. We don't have, need perfect memory for continual learning, I guess. Yeah. So <clears throat> anytime I see something that's a hard threshold, I, I instantly, my uh, you know, antennae go up and saying, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have just a general intellectual curiosity question. Um, have you thought about looking at how your method affects model calibration or adversarial adversarial robustness? It seems like um, enforcing sparsity and uh, and whatnot might actually change uh, something about the logits at the last step of the model. I'd kind of be curious if you get something like better calibration for free with this method. Oh, I am not very aware of that type of research, so to be honest, I, I didn't look into that. Okay. Maybe, yeah. maybe if you have like some pointers, some papers that I can read, it would be great if you can share. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I need to go on to my next uh, meeting, but... Uh... Thanks so much for coming and presenting to us. This is really cool.